Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. At the crossroads is the theme for our series through Lent and now through Holy Week, and tonight we're going to look at the crossroads of forgiveness. You've heard me say this, and it's worth repeating, that we face these crossroads many times in our life. Many times we reach a crossroad and don't know whether to go right or to left or to stay or to go forward. We try to f figure out what lies down each path. We try to choose God's way, but God's way sometimes scares us or gives us an idea that we can't do that. So we look for the easy way. We look for our way. God calls us to choose his way, but it's not easy. It's not easy because we interject our own thoughts and processes into this. We don't trust Jesus implicitly, so it makes it difficult for us. And the choices we make can bring us pain, uh, daunting spiritual pain. It can drive us to our knees. It can destroy us. In some cases, it can give us freedom. Now, in the past of these, we've looked at individual people in the Bible story of Jesus' time during Lent and uh, the Passion Week, but tonight is a personal story. Personal because I think it will bring home the point for you more so than the made-up story that was suggested. It was February 28, 1969. It was a beautiful day, southern Mississippi. It was probably 60 degrees, and people were breaking ground for gardens to be planted in February. If we had any snow that year, it would have been about a sixteenth of an inch and it wouldn't have lasted very long. A little bit of cold, but spring comes early for us. And my brother and I, Kenny Joe, he was a year younger than me, were riding on the bus. Our great uncle was the bus driver. And a couple of stops before our house, about a mile from our house, we stopped to let off some of the other kids on the bus. And we noticed that our daddy was cutting up a garden patch for one of our neighbors. Well, we knew we couldn't get off the bus there. Our great uncle, even though he was a good guy, was pretty strict about what you could and could not do. And getting off the bus before your stop, unless somebody was standing there, was not legit. Daddy was on the tractor. He wasn't able to come to the bus. So we were excited. We got home. We ditched our book bags. He grabbed his bicycle. I never ride a bicycle too much work for me. I'd rather walk. He grabbed his bike, and I took off in behind him, and we walked, and he rode the mile to the place where my daddy was working. My younger brother was excited because he wanted to play with the other kids that he knew lived at that spot. Me, I have this genetic disorder. Early on in my life, my father sat me in the seat of the John Deere tractor, and I just have to have it when I can. And so I knew that if I went, that when my dad was finished, he would offer me the ride. My brother would get offered the ride, too, if he really wanted, but he would probably ride his bike. So my brother left his bike. He went across the road to play with the other kids. I watched my daddy as he back and forth dissed up this dark garden spot. My uncle was there. Uh, the neighbor people were there. We all knew each other. We were chit-chatting. And just before he got done, about a minute or two, three minutes before he got done, he come around to where I was at. He stopped, got down off the tractor, and told me, he says, go and tell your brother we're leaving in just a couple of minutes. He needs to come here, get his bike, and we're going home. And so I was excited. I zipped across the road, told my brother, I said, Daddy says it's time to go. You need to knock it off, come get your bike, and let's go home. And I turned and sped right back across the road because I didn't want to get left behind. Had an opportunity to ride, maybe sit in the tractor, steer the thing. I was excited. My brother followed just a minute or so behind me. And the way it was designed, the road came to the top of a hill where, he would, where we crossed these two driveways. And the driveway where he was at, the bank, came right down to the edge of the road, which meant there was actually no visibility. It's a really bad situation. And just as my daddy was getting done, uh, my brother proceeded to come across the road, and all of us heard what we thought was my dog being hit by a car. Happened a lot in our neighborhood. And as we turned, the car pulled over to the side of the road, and my little brother lay on the side of the road. It was not the dog, it was him. 
I still remember very vividly my dad jumps off the tractor and he runs over to where he's lying, limp and lifeless on the side of the road, and he bends down and he scoops him up in his arms and he gets into a friend's truck and off the road they speed to the hospital, which is six miles in one direction. My uncle grabbed me, we got in his truck, we followed, but we made a stop at our home to get my mama probably the worst ride she's ever had in her life. I was too young to know exactly what was going on. I was only eight. But when we got to the hospital, the doctor met my mama at the door and told her the news that he had probably died on impact. The part that I want you to hear that's really important out of all this story is over the next several days, and I don't know how many because it was a long time ago, Maybe not that long, but long enough, and I was small enough, I wasn't keeping a journal. Over the next several days, what seemed like many, many days, the woman who hit my brother, she was not speeding, she wasn't driving erratically, there were no cell phones, uh, and she didn't have anything to drink or eat in the car, she had not had alcohol or drugs, she was driving the speed limit. Her probably only distraction would have been the AM radio or the 8-track if she had one. But over the next several days, and what seemed like many days, she came every day to our home. And my mama would meet her at the door, and the tears would begin to flow. flow. They would go to the dining table where we had our meals, and they would sit. My mama had coffee and probably something to snack on, and there they sat, and this woman who had killed my little brother and my mama, and they cried with a Bible, my mama's Bible open between them, reading scripture and praying for what seemed like hours. And I don't know how many times I heard my mama tell her, it's okay, I forgive you. My mama extended that forgiveness that this woman so desperately wanted to hear, my mama extended it without any reservation. And this was her second child to lose. She had lost another child uh, about eight years prior. And it was difficult for her. But they cried, and they read God's word, they prayed, and they drank coffee. And my mama gave the forgiveness that this woman wanted to hear. Did she ever take it to heart? I don't know. Did she ever forgive herself or allow herself to be forgiven? I don't know. But it was extended. Now, I have three daughters, two granddaughters, and if this happened to me, I don't know if I could be so forgiving. But I watched my mama forgive this woman, and what we need to understand is that's what Jesus calls us to do. Even in the hardest of times, he calls us to put aside our biases, the things that we understand in this world, and to give that forgiveness he has so freely given to you and to I, to us, to me. It's hard. It's hard when we're hurting. It's hard when someone has hurt us, when somebody has physically hurt us or called us a name or done something to our reputation, or done something else that causes us great pain, it's hard for us to forgive. And I can't think of anything much harder or more difficult to forgive than the taking of the life of my child. But my mama did it. It's difficult because our natural reaction is to want revenge. We want to get even. We want to hurt whoever has hurt us in the same way or worse that they have hurt us. We hold the anger in. We bottle it up and we wait for a time when we can strike, when we can speak words of ugliness, when we can hurt people physically or verbally or through their reputation. We hold it in and we wait for that time because that's what we want. God provides a way for us 
And we see it unfold in Peter. Peter, who denied Jesus three times that morning before the rooster crowed. He goes, and after he sees Jesus as those last, that third time comes off his lips, he runs out of the courtyard in shame, and he weeps his eyes out. He cries and asks for forgiveness for what he's done. And Jesus does forgive him. Never kicks him out of the fold. Judas Iscariot, he realizes what he had done after he kissed Jesus and was marked and marked Jesus for those who came for him and turned him over to be arrested and the things that would happen to him in the coming days. He went into the temple and he threw the silver on the floor because they wouldn't take it back. And in his grief, he went out, having asked for forgiveness, he hung himself of the great sorrow and pain he was having. And that's what guilt does to us when we have done something that needs to be forgiven. The guilt brings us burden. It's like a big, nasty pale, a black, dark cloud that hangs over us. And it haunts our nights, it devastates our days, and it brings us great despair doesn't go away. It's not something we can wish away. It's not something we can will away. We need to ask for forgiveness and we need to grant forgiveness to those who ask it of us. On Maundy Thursday, so many years ago, when Jesus instituted this, that you're going to receive the uh, sacrament of Holy Communion, he didn't tell the disciples, oh, your sins aren't so bad. I'll just wave my hand, speak a few words, and you're done. No. He literally forgives the disciples of their sins. It's not an excuse. It's an actual forgiveness. So there it is by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. I can't will it. I can't wish it. I can't do anything to make it happen. It's all God working in me. And if we turn against him, if we turn him off, then we don't have the power to forgive and we don't have the power to receive forgiveness. So once we come to grips with our guilt and once we ask God for forgiveness and once we trust in Jesus and receive his body and blood and receive the forgiveness he gives, we can forgive ourselves and we can be forgiven by God. More importantly, we can forgive others. It's at that point now that we can forgive those people who hurt us. And I don't know about you. I don't have lots of enemies that I'm aware of, but there aren't many days go by that somebody doesn't hurt me. Some people deliberately, some people not knowingly. It's something that happens in this world because we are people. We don't get along most of the time. It's like the professor told our class when we were doing uh, pastors as counselors. He says he has lots of people come into him. He's a professional counselor as well as a pastor. You know, a husband and wife that come in and say, I don't love my wife anymore. Or I don't like my wife anymore. And he tells them, you know, there's lots of mornings I get up, I don't like my wife, but I still love her because God loves me. It's hard and it's difficult for us, but it's not impossible because of what Christ has already done. He's gone to the cross and he's paid the price for your sins. And as it says in Scripture, he tells you that if you believe and if you ask with a sincere heart, your sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. Our problem is, is we don't like it when he forgives people that have hurt us. We don't think they deserve it. But honestly, we don't deserve it. We're just as guilty as they are. And until we learn to trust and to receive the gift he has for us, we will continue to carry these burdens. People who follow the uh, devout, who are devout to the Jewish faith, Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, on the Day of Atonement, they have a practice whereby they think of somebody, bring to mind someone that has hurt them, and they seek that person out on that particular day and they ask for forgiveness and they give forgiveness.
Reconciliation is the word we use uh, from God's own words. Reconciliation, because it's not about just forgiving and forgetting. It's about forgiving and learning to still love that person. Again, through Jesus Christ. And so, why not tonight, here in just a little bit, we're going to have Holy Communion. You're going to receive the very body and blood of Jesus Christ that allows you, empowers you to be forgiven, to receive forgiveness, those things we need to do. How about tonight, as you receive Holy Communion, think about somebody that's hurt you, or you have hurt, and make an effort to go forth and either forgive or be forgiven. Ask for forgiveness. If the entire world did that, and that's what we are called to do, what a difference it would make. It would make the headlines, I believe, if every Christian did that. Of course, we're not. And I don't know what the other churches are doing tonight. We didn't get together on this. But we can make a difference for us. And that's where it starts. And the person you forgive or take forgiveness from, receive forgiveness from, they may go and do the same thing, moved by your and my actions. Christ, in his dying moment, forgave those who had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers. Because they truly were pawns. They didn't know what was going on around them. And he forgives you and he forgives me even though we're undeserving. Through his body and his blood, you have the power not only to receive forgiveness from God, but to give it to those who hurt you and to ask for forgiveness when you need it. My prayer and the church's prayer that as we move forward through uh, the rest of Holy Week and as we move through the rest of our lives, we would find it easier and easier to forgive. When you reach that crossroad and either need to forgive or be forgiven, take up the cross of Christ and allow him to work in you and make the right decision. And if you make the wrong decision, as a child of God, he still forgives you. He still loves you. He will still be there for the next intersection of forgiveness you meet. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds through your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.